Since we're now diving headlong into the game of life um, exploration around here, where we explore different ways to find natural restrictions within the phason dynamics that should restrict our game of life, I thought it would be good for me to try to update my explanation of code theoretic thermodynamics and some of the connections to um, special relativity and gravity theory insofar as the idea of a quantum of acceleration and of course the familiar idea of the relationship between um, the propagation through internal clock time versus propagation through space over some quantity of shift vector actions. So with this presentation as compared to the previous ones, um, I'm trying to think more in my presentation about showing a relationship uh, between these three things. So the second law of thermodynamics is somewhat antiquated for four reasons. Uh, the first is that it was designed for impossible closed systems. And the second, right, everything is a thermally off equilibrium system and you can't literally close a system. Second, it was uh, pre-quantum mechanics. So today, non-locality such as quantum fluctuations preventing thermal equilibrium and other non-classic qualities are known to be more physically real than the old classic clockwork view of the 19th century. And third, it did not account for the self-organizing force of gravity, which has evolved the universe from the more homogeneous heat distribution in the early hydrogen universe to our more complexly organized 81 stable atom universe of solar systems, biospheres, and so forth. <laughs> and fourth, it did not account for the negentropic force-like behavior of non-conserved abstract information, emergent information, where the total information of a system includes conserved quantum information, little i, and non-conserved emergent information, E, such that the total information, capital I, cannot be conserved, even in principle. Complex systems theory and the notion of emergent information that loops back to guide the negentropic evolution of a system was unknown in the 19th century. In fact, it's poorly understood even today because complex systems cannot be accurately modeled in computers and quantum mechanics cannot deal with complex systems. Not only are they exponentially out of the range of any conceivable computation technology, they are too sensitive to initial conditions and quantum perturbations, even if we could compute them. You wouldn't really be able to predict them due to the, the sensitivity to initial conditions, for example. However, quantum gravity theorists should still be very concerned with thermal dynamics specifically with its modification in, in order to unify it with quantum mechanics and the theory of space-time. And the object where the theory of space-time, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics converge at their limits is the black hole. So we're all familiar with these three equations. So Davy's equation is not quantum. It uses classic thermodynamics and general relativity and there's a special phase transition, which is non-trivial, in which the golden ratio is on the right side of the equation. And then in Rovelli's equation, which incorporates quantum mechanics, assuming both quantum mechanics and general relativity to be true, and using principles from entropy theory, again, the right side of the equation is the golden ratio. And then in Marcelo Amaral's equation, the golden ratio relates the loop quantum gravity parameter to black hole entropy in an even more elegant uh, expression. So from these equations, it seems the golden ratio has something to do with the unification of thermodynamics and quantum gravity. Is there any other limit in physics where this golden ratio shows up? Well, yes, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics tells us that nature's statistical limit of non-locality is the golden ratio to the negative five, 
You can review Lucene Hardy's results on this, or you can consult Marcello here to understand why he argues that this is nature's limit of non-locality. One of the most important parameters of the standard model of particle physics is the Kabibo angle. There are three solid papers arguing why it is the same golden ratio angle that we use to transform E8 to the Elser Sloan quasi crystal and then to the QSN. And to understand why it's the same angle, you can see me. If you look at the hypervector, you have one way of looking at the angle, but then if you decompose the projections to sub projections of, of lower dimensional objects to the projective space and then you composite it, you can get all the way down to the one dimensional lines or root vectors of E8 that would be sent to the projective space according to a different angle than the hypervector angle. And that angle is the same angle as in those three papers in prestigious journals. So it's very interesting that something related to the standard model of particle physics has a relationship to our projective angle. It's not the golden ratio. It's just a very elegant um, expression of the golden ratio, like the arc cosine or arc tangent, one over the square root, one over uh, the golden ratio cubed. So of course, we think there is a code theoretic quantum uh, thermodynamic action playing out um, in within our code theoretic quantum gravity theory. And we think it is deeply based on the golden ratio for good mathematical reason, right? That's what we think here in our program. Code theoretic quantum thermodynamics is a hidden variables theory that is allowed by Bell's theorem. This is because it is both non-local and non-deterministic. Code theorists, like us, are interested in information and noise. They are interested in economization or least computational action. Economization of symbols in the expression of a code is, an, is something that code theorists are interested in. Self-referential symbolic spatio-temporal codes can use spatial and temporal symbols with organizational rules and syntactical degrees of freedom. The dynamic evolution of a phason code is exactly a self-referential spatio-temporal code. And as with all codes, there is an irreducible set of symbols, rules, and syntactical freedom in our phason code. A symbol is an object, such as a vector or an n simplex. A symbol can be an action, such as a reflection, a Clifford rotor, or a spinner. So what we are interested in is not in the compo composite symbols. We are interested in the irreducible symbols of our spatiotemporal code. Trivially, quantum mechanics is all about thermodynamics. For example, the Schrodinger equation cannot give you a quantum probability unless you first tell it what the energy landscape is around the particle that you are asking it to statistically predict. If one wishes to envision a quantum gravity theory which modifies or completes space-time theory, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics, one must construct an energetic statistical principle within such formalism. For us at QGR, that energetic principle is computational savings. We call this trit savings and loss of trit savings. Where there is potential for loss of trit savings, there will be a lower probability to measure a particle at that space-time coordinate. And where there is potential for trit savings, there will be a higher probability Understanding where our code theoretic quantum thermodynamics and, in general, our quantum gravity and particle physics program is going requires that we deeply understand empire waves. Empire waves are very different from empires. This is a 20 group cycling through one of three primary Hamiltonian circuits that are available in the QSN. 
One is the icosa dodecahedron, an Archimedean solid, and the other two are platonic solids, the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. And there are other Hamiltonian circuits that can be chosen, but those are the three primary candidates. The fading purple trail is the developable surface, Richard, is that right? If it's not technically correct, then we'll just go, have to go over it later because I put it in about a lot of slides. So this, fa this fading purple trail is, the d is, this, is a developable surface from the time domain integration of many coordinate changes in this closed circuit. The important point here is that a developable surface is remarkably richer than any frozen frame of the time domain integration. A single 20 group is far simpler than the developable surface of its Hamiltonian circuit, which in this case includes non-20 groups. But the main message is that this, these ideas of developable surfaces where you're focused upon special portions of the empire, the portions that are more dense with objects than other cylindrical um, radiations go as cylinders going out from some emperor, those are rather boring, right? They're just these things that go out. What's interesting is the developable surface, which is all about how the quasi-particle moves. If it moves with an internal Hamiltonian clock circuit, and then does some other movement as it propagates forward through space, such as a right or left-handed helix. All of that information is encoded into the developable surface of this object that we should call an empire wave to distinguish it from empire. And the empire wave is far richer and more interesting for our purposes than a single empire. So similarly, an empire is fantastically simpler, as I said, than, and less interesting than its developable surface. One special aspect of certain empires in the QSN are the cylindrical beams that point radially outward from the center emperor of the empire in each frozen step. So these are the cylinders that have a higher density of empire trits than interstitial cylinders of the same volume. One quality is that they drop in density with distance, these special cylinders. Perhaps with your imagination, you can zoom out from Ray's animation. So that's a Hamiltonian circuit, but what would the developable surface look like if you could see just the special beams of the empire? Because if you see all the empire, it might get too noisy for you to pick up on anything but perhaps by ignoring the less dense cylinders and focusing on the densest beams, you could create an animation that would give you an interesting uh, developable surface that your, m that your eye would pick up on and interpret as an animation over the time domain. Can you create in your mind a picture of what the developable surface of these special dense uh, cylinders would look like? Right? So this is what I want you to start imagining because I've been imagining it for a long time and after we play in 2D, we're going to start playing in 3D and we, and we will have significantly more richness in 3D, right, in the QSN. And so you should start imagining what is this idea of an empire that goes to the end of the universe and does not propagate. It's it's just instantly there, and it's complicated looking because it is the integration of two very different motions. The motion of the quasi-particle, the local aspect of the particle, 
through its spherical Hamiltonian circuit relative to its chiral forward spatial propagation through time. And then when you start to try to visualize that developable surface and then integrate the two, well, of course, it becomes a bit impossible, right, just to do it in your mind because it's two, two very different patterns. But each of those patterns, this is what you can't see in Ray's animation, but, it need, but, but, but if you could see the developable surface that, that emanates, right, and evolves from Ray's animation, right, of course, in, we'd have to decide, well, should we be allowing these interstitial things that are not 20 groups? Um, so, we may not use the degree 60 vertex, so don't worry about the empire of that one in particular. This, I'm just trying to convey the, the general form or principle here. Just visualize how in a single frame you have no developable surface, but over the time domain, you do. And as you know, this is a primitive model for us for the internal clock of something like, such as an electron at rest, right? Because this is not propagating. Every single frame is being used here to, um, to express the animation of the developable surface of the internal Hamiltonian circuit that comes back to close upon itself. So let us consider this to be an approximation of a spherical path. Next, allow the entire Hamiltonian circuit of the internal clock to take on a circular path. And then extrude that circular path along some direction into a right or left-handed helix. And then integrate the developable surface of the helical propagation through space with the developable surface of the spherical internal clock circuit with these cylinders that drop in density with distance. That's the animation that's a difficult animation to make, but when we have it, it will be very interesting to look at. Remember, we're focusing here on the special cylinders, which drop in density, so your integration of the two developable surfaces is like a discretized field that drops in density with distance, if you're focused on the cylinders that have higher density of trits than the interstitial cylinders. So it's not easy to visualize so many elements integrating together. However, we have a few qualities that we can explore to understand polarity, spin, and charge. Not to understand them, but to make guesses or crazy conjectures about these three foundational binary sign values. One is the helicity sign value of the discretized field along its helical path through space. The other element is the direction of the spherical path of the internal clock Hamiltonian circuit relative to the helical path through space. Today it is known to some physicists that an electron takes a right-handed helical path through space. A positron, according to them, takes a left-handed helical path through space. And of course, we all know that the magnetic field wrapping around the propagating positron or electron takes on a right or left helicity, according to the right or the left-handed rule, depending on whether it's a positron or an electron. Now, whether we can find a physically realistic correspondence with our ideas here remains to be seen. However, we will have to deal with one other first principles geometric binary sign value other than helicity that we're, in my opinion, stuck with, unless we can find a reason why we're not stuck with it. And to explain that, think about the, the idea that the Hamiltonian circuit of the spherical clock path may be constrained in terms of the possible ways that it can move on its path relative to the axis of the quasi-particle's forward helical propagation through space. So just imagine there is some ideal way. But if there is some ideal logical constraint of the internal clock path within the symmetry of the QSN, um, 
that has this idea of ideal trit savings, well then there should be an exact mirror opposite of that Hamiltonian circuit that is equally efficient. Right? So this, you can imagine this helical path going forward and then there is some spherical Hamiltonian circuit also operating. And let us just imagine that that, he, that helical, that spherical clock circuit has some reasons for why it is what it is relative to the axis of the, of the helix, of the, of the spatial propagation helix of the particle through space. If there were such, uh, such a logical way based on trit savings or based on the symmetry of the QSN or some other reason, then the way I think about it is you flip that with a mirror symmetry of just the opposite direction along the same path of that, helo of that spherical circuit, Hamiltonian, relative to the forward propagation. So in this regard, I suspect that if there is such a logical constraint, it must also include its mirror opposite. So we have covered two binary values here. So without taking any of this too seriously, because these are just um, ideas that I've been waiting to share again with you before we get more deeply into the game of life stuff, um, let us call these values conveniently plus and minus and up and down, right? Where the helical path, like a positron or an electron, is plus and minus just like a positron and electron are plus and minus. And we have these other, this other value, which is just an abstract label. We could say red and green. But we'll call it up and down because I'm very loosely saying maybe this can be something we discuss with respect to a model for spin. So there would be four possibilities of what you could measure. You could measure negative and up, and you could measure positive and up, and you could measure negative and down, and you could measure positive and down. So charge and spin in modern physics are abstract and without any first principles meaning. So there is, in some sense, a dead end in terms of understanding the idea of geometric realism. So let us interpret charge for fun or plus and negative as the helicity sign value of the spatial propagation component of the empire waves discretized field. And let us interpret spin, just for fun, as the direction of the spherical internal clock Hamiltonian circuit relative to the spatial propagation helix along with its mirror sign value. The interaction between two discretized fields of trits defined by the values of two or more of these internal clock-based quasi-particles is based on these following values. First, the ratio of frames used to advance the particle through internal clock circuits relative to forward propagation units through space. The interaction of two particles, one with some ratio A, of propagation through space relative to internal clock experience and another particle that has a different ratio. They should logically, with the trit savings principle in the QSN, the computational least action principle, this should be important. This should at least be something we discuss. Their inertial frames of reference should be important for their statistical interaction. So this information, in part, defines the empire wave field around the particle itself. Second, these are the relationship things that should influence a statistical model. The fields are dipoles, and I use that word on purpose because a dipole should not be confused with a bipole. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. These are bipoles. And I, use, and I use the word bipole because I don't want you to automatically think that it must mean a magnetic dipole. But a dipole, a magnetic dipole, is a bipole. Um, and the angular relationships between the 
bipoles of the two empire waves determines the strength of interaction at a given distance. Third, the side of the bipole is key. Paired one way and they become more repulsive as distance decreases. Paired the opposite way, they attract as distance increases. This is because the special higher density cylinders um, have an important distance to density ratio as you take volumes um, of those cylinders at different radii from the origin, the emperor. Fourth, the spin values, as I've defined them, those should influence the statistical probabilities for interaction between two or more of, of these um, objects which have a kind of guiding, statistically guiding wave that's physically realistic in some sense because it's not just an abstract tool, it's this idea of geometric realism and this wave object guides the system statistically. And so this value that I'm claiming might be in this model where it's a binary value of a sort of spherical direction relative to the helix, it seems that two particles interacting, you would want to know, well, what are their spins? You know, if you labeled that as your idea of spin. So these mirror values are analogous to right and left helicity, but applied to the spherical rotation, as I explained. This value is encoded, right? The spin value is encoded, just as the helicity value of forward propagation. Both of these values are encoded into the empire wave discretized field. And this, and this, this aspect, which is the spin value in this system, which is encoded in the empire wave, which goes to the end of the universe, co-determines the statistics of interaction along with the helicity value. So, fifth, there may be a temporal phase or resonance-dissonance relationship between two empire particle fields. So I don't want to elaborate on this idea here about the time, about resonance and dissonance, um, but I do have some ideas on it that I feel would be overkill for this presentation. You may recall uh, the following simple diagram that I used in a previous presentation. This idea of chasing after trit savings and uh, the no crashing theorem, avoiding trit cost, which determines the statistical probabilities of the random walks of the particles themselves. The simple uh, game of life probabilistic cellular automaton, automata rules are collectively constructive and destructive empire wave interference based on a, a least computational action principle. Now, how can we relate this all to noise, entropy, information, computation, and quantum statistics? First, entropy and noise. I will argue that they are the same thing for our purposes. Let me point to the logarithmic value W in Boltzmann's entropy. We can correlate W to the ratio of parallel vector classes within some system of particles. That is the ratio of parallel vector classes relative to N, where N is the quantity of oscillators or particles in your system. Uh, please kind of take physical or mental notes so that if I say anything that you don't understand the justification of the statement that you email me and give me an opportunity to, um, to show you justification or explain because I don't want any of this to go to waste. So let us use the term vector in the broader sense um, that mathematicians sometimes use it as opposed to physicists or people uh, doing geometry. An object with two values, such as the T over P ratio and direction. So you have a direction, then you have a T over P ratio. So I'm, I'm calling this, a uh, I'm defining here a vector as just two values. It's part of a system with two values. 
the degree of matching of the T over P ratio between two particles influences how these two empire waves will interact statistically. That is, it changes um, the magnitude of their probabilities for trit savings and loss of trit savings. But so uh, too do other scalars and vectors within this system. And I'm not saying that there are many values that influence the statistics in our toy model because there really are only a few. The other two may be the mirror value, A or B, for the internal clock. Who knows, maybe that's spin or something like that, or maybe that leads us in a thought direction that allows us to recover a good model for spin. And I think another must be uh, the degree of resonance and dissonance. Um, perhaps we can recover the known statistics of quantum resonance and dissonance uh, with our model someday. In my, in my um, most important citation in the 100 plus citations in the LENR paper that I wrote, Chen et al., that's the most important citation, I mention how the quantum probabilities for nuclear tunneling go from nearly impossible, like 10 to the negative 120 probability, to, to literally 100% mathematically when the quantum resonance and dissonance value between two nucleons, which means there's some relationship between their fields, is a particular value. And only at that value does it go to a probability of one. So the final two uh, values that I want to inspire you to be kind of on the lookout for, to be waiting to find in our game of life explorations in the QSN are symmetry and angular relationships. That is, when these empire wave fields enter into a group wherein the group has certain angular relationships between the fields, and then furthermore, when the angular relationships are part of a closed network, like the zone, the plastic zone model of our 600 cell projection, I am saying that those things must, in my mind at least, logically influence the computational principle of least action idea statistically with, based on the trit savings. So you should meet with me if you're interested in learning more about the ideas that I have on this idea of symmetry um, and angular relationship. Um, I can't talk about it here because I'm trying to do faster presentations. But I will discuss with you scattering angle values right now, just briefly, and my research into various anomalies that occur when nanoscale atomic ensembles possess H3 symmetry. So in the year that I spent reading papers to prepare to write that 50-page um, um, LENR paper, I really learned a lot about some very interesting anomalous physics that are occurring only with H3 symmetric nanoclusters. It's very, very interesting. It's not predicted by quantum mechanics, um, and it's not predicted by any other known theory. So they're, they're, re they're really good anomaly papers. So our energetic statistical approach is based on two very simple things. The achievement of trit savings, and the avoidance of the loss of trit, I'm sorry, the avoidance of trit crashing, that's a typo, and the avoidance of the loss of trit savings, which relates to mass. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe two of these things could be converged into one thing, but I see three for the time being. There's the, the, there is the achievement of trit savings, that is a computational savings. There is the avoidance of trit crashing, which is not exactly a computational savings issue. It just changes the, changes the, uh, the, the T over P ratio of the particle and generally changes its direction. And then there is um, the temporary loss of trit savings from a massive particle's constant rate of self-interaction with its own empire wave. 
So when it temporarily loses the benefit of that TRIT savings, uh, the system, you will interpret that as a deceleration event and a drag, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. All right, I'm going to talk more about mass because um, it's important, but I want to plant this in your mind here on this slide. The temporary loss of TRIT savings between a quasi-particle propagator and its own em empire wave it's falling in a twisting, winding path into its own lowest energy pathway. <clears throat> it falls into this pathway, and if you interrupt that falling into this least computational action flow pattern, it will cost you because you've lost TRIT savings. And that cost is the generation of, th that cost is the behavior of mass. So it has mass intrinsically because it has a clock. And <clears throat> work occurs when you change its um, ratio of T over P. And there's a resistance to that. There's a cost, a drag. So the loss of TRIT savings is not the generation of mass. I shouldn't have written that. The loss of TRIT savings um, is the resistance that mass expresses, that massive particles express, wherein they, it requires energy and work occurs. When there's a loss of TRIT savings from the self-interaction with the propagator's own empire wave discretized field. So put differently, if you integrate the developable surface over the time domain, both forward and backwards in time, you will see a model for electron self-interaction. Our quasi-particle patterns, as I said, fall forward in a chiral winding path through space-time into the highest computational or TRIT savings path of their own time-integrated empire wave field. And it's even more complicated than that. It's not just that they're falling forward in this helical path. They're falling forward into the integration of this Hamiltonian circuit combined with the helical propagation through space. And there's a way to do that with the maximum amount of computational savings, actions, frame, you know, objects, trits. So you should look at it like an energy landscape that determines the, ran the statistical probabilities of the random walks of the particle. So if they fall forward at a steady ratio or division between their internal clock and forward helical propagation contributions to the developable surface of the empire wave field, or I should say, and that's one sentence, and that's how they're falling forward, right? So think of the quasi-particle like a Pac-Man eating TRIT savings and following a computational least action principle as it falls down the lowest energy landscape of a complex twisting path defined by the clock cycles and the spatial forward helix. So uh, where is a hidden variables code here that comports with the statistics of quantum mechanics. We can think about each sequential frame of a quasi-particle position as being a single choice from a very large set of other choices that were possible. The choices are the discrete and finite set of shift coordinates of the projection window in the higher dimensional space. The probability amplitudes for each of n possible choices of shifts of the window for some frozen frame or position of a particle is defined by our least computational action principle. This is the combination of the no crashing theorem and the TRIT savings statistical rule, the principle of least computational action. Consider that you can continue animating your quasi-particle propagator through its clock cycles and its forward helical path through space by choosing from, let us say, three 
different shifts of the projection window. So that would not be physically realistic, but we're just going to say three to make a point. Now let us say that choice one would result in trick crashing, so its probability goes to zero. And let us say that shift positions two and three result in one trip savings each. The probability for each of those shift vector possibilities would be one half, such that it would be, in a sense, a random walk, because you cannot deterministically predict whether it will be choice number two or three, because they both have a 50% probability because the total possibilities were two, and they each had only one trit savings mapped to them. So it would so be a probability of one half each. And if you modeled this in a computer, you would have to hook it up to a random number generator or a pseudo-random number generator. In reality, the number of choices is exponentially higher than three. And because with such large numbers, there may be generally two or more choices within the same that, ha that possess the same magnitude of trit savings, these simple rules cannot, even in principle, result in a deterministic theory. So how would you model the probabilities? If there were probabilities for all coordinates in space-time, then something smooth, such as Schrodinger's formalism, would be nice. After all, we have a non-deterministic game of life based specifically on waveform interaction mathematics. So the Schrodinger wave formalism would be great, you'd think. However, our empire waveforms are discrete. They are pixelated. They do not allow any probability for certain coordinates in space-time. Accordingly, I suspect that some formalism that lends itself to discreteness such as Heisenberg's matrix approach, is probably going to be more appropriate for us. We have discussed how and why, from first principles, our hidden variables, quantum mechanics, and quantum gravity toy model. I don't want to overstate and call it a theory. But it is slowly emerging to become a better and better, you know, a, a, a more sophisticated toy model, and we're starting to do our 2D game of life, so it will become a theory someday. But you can see, at least from first principles, I'm arguing why it is in principle, uh, it, I it is by first principles non-deterministic. So how and why is it non-local, right? Because in order to not violate Bell's theorem, it must be non-deterministic and non-local. So we've argued so far why it is non deterministic from first principles, and uh, you all know why it's non-local by first principles, but I'll cover it anyway. This brings us to an allowed and rigorous interpretation of quantum mechanics, wherein we reject the conjecture of wave-particle duality that's built into the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. For us, the forward and backward time-integrated developable surface of the empire wave is always coexisting with the local aspect of the propagating quasi-particle. The particle is always falling into some time domain empire wave, whether it is its own guiding wave alone for some moments between two galaxies, but generally in combination with some energy landscape of other empire waves in addition to its own. The empire wave running in both directions of time within some ordered set of, part of, 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 of waves guides the particle statistically, right? So there's, there's this idea that, that our physics will have to integrate, like when we do computations, I believe to understand the energy landscape, you can never take an empire. It's too boring. There are no physics. There are no quasi-particles in one frame. There is just nothing. There's this, you can arbitrarily pick some object and say, well, what's its empire? And then you look at the empire and it's this relatively radial kind of thing. You only will have physics and the notion of energy landscapes with an ordered set of two or more of these shift vector actions, right? You need an animation of at least two 
And there's no good reason in my mind to calculate the energy landscape in this discretized manner only in one direction of time. It seems that you're going to have to arbitrarily select a cutoff. You're going to have to anticipate somehow when you build these models, well, what, is, what would it look like forward in time? What would it look like backwards in time? Some number of frames that you can compute, and then that becomes your sub-quantum mechanics um, discretized waveform that determines the statistical probabilities of you asking as a measure within the system trapped in some area of, of, of space-time where you just want to know, all right, well, I want to know what is the statistical probability that in two seconds or some time two that this particle will be here. If you, if you want to know that question, you must give your, your statistical system some segment of time that includes more than one frame. And to me, you take, you take some time here where the particle is at time one, and then you go forward and backward in the integration. And that whole object, mathematically, that, in, that developable surface of this integrated time domain notion of a guide wave, goes both directions. So, it can never escape its own empire wave guide. So, for moments at a time, for Planck moments at a time, it may be possible for a quasi-particle to be free of the interaction with the empire waves of other particles in the universe. But it can never be free or disconnected from its own waveguide, its own empire wave field integrated over time. But it's generally also guided statistically according to our computational least action principle by uh, the empire waves of its environment, right? In any physically realistic duration of time, even between two galaxies. If you just wait enough moments, you're going to probably have some interaction with a field. So there's realistically always the interaction of the empire waves integrated over time of the other particles, other quasi-particles, their empire waves, and the integration of all of them into a sort of quantum field, discretized quantum field theory. But the most important one is typically its own, the self, the electron, our model of electron self-interaction, for example. All right, so let's loop back to the minimization of this W value in Boltzmann's entropy. How do you minimize trit savings in terms of your pattern of projection window shift vectors on an ordered set of n choices to create a quasi-particle animation? So if we're minimizing trit savings, we're increasing entropy. So how do we increase entropy in this toy model? You minimize trit savings by maximizing the quantity of parallel vector classes. So once again, vector here is not restricted to the geometric use or the typical physical use of the term vector. You can minimize vectors by, you can minimize parallel vector classes by decreasing dissonance between empire waves and or by decreasing parallel propagation direction classes and or by decreasing a few of the other values that we discussed earlier. So we're looking to increase entropy, increase noise. Now increasing parallel vector counts increases noise and entropy again, and it increases the frequency of what I call quanta of acceleration. So the frequency over time of microscopic quanta of acceleration must increase when you increase the vector count, where that term includes deceleration, right? So I, when, I, right, when we say acceleration, we can, mean also, we can mean slowing down or speeding up. So a quantum of acceleration is really a quantum of not mass generation. I apologize for the misstatement. It is a quantum, a quantum of acceleration is an expression of what mass does, what, what it, what makes it mass. It resists 
So why? But why is a quantum of acceleration a quantum of the expression of, of mass? Well, when you temporarily decrease the magnitude of trit savings from your quasi-particle that is falling in at a constant rate into its twisting time domain empire wave, you are messing, you're messing with a constant rate of trit savings defined by that path's ratio of t over p. You're changing t over p. Think of it like a rift. So this can be interpreted as a drag on the particle or a resistance to acceleration. But there is a logical minimum of this occurring in a single frame at some time too. This is a quantum of acceleration and a quantum of work. That minimum, right? Just one, one frame. One, you just keep slowing it down and going smaller and you'll see that there becomes an irreducible quantum of acceleration and work. Now, it is a quantum of negative trit savings because it is a temporary loss to the enjoyment of the trit savings as the quasi-particle falls into this strange twisting path with composed of the Hamiltonian circuit of the, of the clock and its forward propagation at a constant rate integrated over time. It was before you messed with it, okay, with a photon or some other particle's field, it was enjoying that perhaps for a long time and then you mess with it and you, you create a loss of trit savings temporarily, a quantum of negative trit savings. Now, when this quantum of acceleration occurs via work, there should be a sort of rift, I can't think of a better word right now, in the empire wave field that propagates outward at the frame rate of the system times the minimum length of the system. I want to show you a video to uh, illustrate um, the idea of a rift. I had a video here that I put the wrong link into, but it's basically the curvy, wavy surface of curtains, right, in a window. And, the, and as, as their periodic um, lattices of the thread fibers uh, move in these irrational flow patterns, ang angles relative to another, you get these propagating uh, moray patterns. So my, what I'm trying to uh, paint for you in your, in your mind is that, as I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint a picture for you of photon emission, okay? So the point here is that when this quantum of acceleration occurs via work, it has to be by work, not accelerating by falling into trit savings. So if it just falls into trit savings by falling into the attractive empire wave field of some other delicious set of least computational trit savings, uh, then the rift does not occur. But if it occurs without the replacement of the trit savings, where you violently disrupt temporarily its previous constant rate of propagation through its clock cycles relative to space, uh, it seems to me, I don't know why, but every time I think about it, I get this visualizations of a kind of rift, uh, like a moray pattern that propagates outward um, from the local particle at the frame rate of the system times the minimum length of the system. So I see this propagation rift as photon emission. It does not have a Hamiltonian circuit, this, this quasi-particle. So this, this quasi-particle that moves generally at the, at the maximum speed limit of the system, which is defined by first principles of just minimum length times the frame rate, um, <clears throat> it doesn't have a Hamiltonian circuit. It doesn't have an internal clock. It's a simpler quasi-particle pattern in this sense. Um, its empire wave field, when you integrate it over time and see the developable surface, e it's not going to be as rich or complex as uh, that of something like a massive particle. So accordingly, for some system of particles inside of some boundary, 
at some fixed energy, if we increase the quantity of parallel vector classes, we must increase the frequency of deceleration events. But that is, we increase the frequency of quanta of acceleration. So we have, we have a quasi-particle that has this developable surface integrated over the time domain in both directions. And that object, which goes outwards, and where we're focused on the cylinders that have higher density, and when we look at that integration and we say, all right, what is in that, like what is that integrated field encoding? Well, a couple things that it's encoding is it's encoding a ratio of propagation through space relative to the Hamiltonian circuits of its internal clock. And if you realize that this is like, um, similar to a de Broglie pilot wave, um, and Bohm's later, you know, advancing on that idea. It's not his, it's not, not at all, it's like there's a lot about his ideas that this is not like. For example, ours is non-deterministic. His is deterministic. His is set in smooth space-time. Ours is set in discretized space-time. And there are probably other differences. But the similarity is that this um, guide wave guides the statistics. The similarity is that we are saying that this wave is not an abstract invention, but it has physical realism, that it's real. And, and also that we are rejecting the Copenhagen assumption of uh, wave particle duality, where they don't, where they never exist at the same time as a single system, and so think about Marcelo. If you're that quasi particle and you're in a system of rules that is based on least computational action, the Pac-Man that chases after trit savings, right? Then what you're doing as you fall into that developable surface statistically over time, it's like you're falling along a path of least computational action or maximal trit savings. The path is complicated because it is not just a helical path. It is this integrated process of the integration of two time domain developable surfaces that compose the overall uh, empire wave of a massive particle. Now, if you're falling into it at time one and then you're falling into it at time two and time three and so on, because you're a particle, let's say, between two galaxies. So there's really nothing else around to disturb you other than quantum, maybe Dirac's virtual sea of particles that could pop up and disrupt you. But other than that, you're, imagine that you're falling into this maximum level of computational savings, trit savings. So if Ray comes along uh, and he, like, shoots a particle gun at you and there becomes a strong interaction such that work is done on you. And that work can accelerate you or decelerate you, but it changes your ratio of propagation through space versus your internal clock. And by changing that ratio, you're changing the enjoyment of this process of falling into your old pattern, the, the, the other developable surface. You just rip that violently. And, the only, and, and that violent rip away from the enjoyment of your constant rate of trit savings with your old inertial frame of reference should cost you some money. Like you, if your whole system is based on trit savings and these waves that guide you statistically according to a least computational action, if you disrupt it, you jerk it with this idea of a quantum of, of acceleration, then you have yourself a, a, a moment of work, a moment of resistance. The action that, of what mass does, part of what defines mass. And then it's over. And then if Ray stops bothering you, you'll go on at that new fixed rate of T over P until somebody else, like Cinziana, disrupts you. So we must increase the frequency of acceleration. So I'll just read this again and say, so accordingly for some system of particles in some boundary at some fixed energy, if we, this, this is, I hope you guys can understand my words here. If we increase the quantity of parallel vector classes, 
what we're doing is we're increasing entropy. We are changing that logarithmic value w in Boltzmann's formula. And therefore, we must increase the frequency of deceleration events because when you have a higher quantity of vectors, you have a higher quantity of collisions. And the collisions I am proposing are composed of these quanta of acceleration events, these quanta of work. So you increase that. When you increase the quantity of parallel vector classes, you, you increase the noise, uh, you increase the dissonance, you, you, you get everything out of sync, in a sense, such that you, in, you explode the number of parallel vector classes in these classes of vectors and scalars that I talked about earlier. And you will, by doing this, obviously, kind of trivially, increase the frequency of the deceleration events. Because in general, when particles collide, they're going at some t over p in one direction. They encounter a repulsive relationship with another particle. And in general, the way the t over p ratio occurs is it doesn't typically, or doesn't, it doesn't accelerate them as often as it decelerates them. And so this shifts. I, I said this earlier for a reason. There's a fixed energy of this system, a fixed number of particles, and a fixed boundary, right? So we're going to conserve everything in this system. So this shifts some of the total conserved energy from the sum of the kinetic energy of all the particles. So you take all your propagators. Let's say you have two propagators, and they're both moving at some velocity. So you can then sum the velocity over some time of both, and you have this idea of a sum of kinetic energy. So it goes from this. So you're robbing the kinetic energy of the system. You're robbing the sum of the kinetic energy of the behavior of all the oscillators or all the propagators in your system. So you're robbing from this to increase the amount of radiation energy in the system. Because when you have these deceleration events, there's this rift that occurs. It's like a, you can call it a quasi-particle. Maybe it's a photon. But in my mind, it's like a rift of a quasi-particle that doesn't have an internal clock, no, no spherical Hamiltonian circuit. And that's energy that's playing off the action of the frame rate, etc., and it's coherent. We have to find out why it would be coherent. So you're making, you're making this acceleration quantum, which creates a jerk, like a rift. Like if I'm, if I'm moving through the water at this rate, right? I'm making a wake behind me. Richard is this giant 100-foot tall guy, and he grabs me, and really in just about a half a second, he, he jerks me, right? He slows me down really fast, and, the, and, then I continue, and then he lets me continue on at a new rate, slower or faster than the old rate, and then a coherent kind of pattern evolves around me. So it is that change, that quantum of acceleration, that causes a rift, a ripple. And in, and in real water, that ripple would be observed. You can watch it propagate. So that ripple, when you decelerate a particle, you change its t over p by work, not by it falling into a more attractive trit savings pathway from the environment. You should, in my imagination, and I do think about this a lot, I visualize a lot, I see a rift, and I see the rift as being the best analogy as, as something almost like a moray pattern that propagates at a finite rate, where the rate, because it has no clock, is exactly the frame rate of the system times the minimum distance that the particle can advance. So you'd have a natural speed limit for that rift, that quasi-particle pattern. So in this idea of the conserved energy, we reduce by increasing entropy we increase collisions, <coughs> which increases deceleration quanta, which increases the emission of photons, or whatever these ripples are that I see in my imagination, conserves the overall energy of the total amount of quasi-particles, but shifts it to the radiative energy <coughs> of the photons. So that is, if the sum of the kinetic energy is x, then the photonic energy is the total energy minus x. So getting back to the question about how this game of life of interacting empire waves is inherently non-local, 
Of course you know the answer to that question, because that's what we work on. The empire waves extend outward to the end of the universe. They are always there. They don't propagate to the end of the universe. They're just, the, those cylinders are there. So they're always there, like other physicists interpret the wave function as being a physical object and where some of them interpret a guiding statistical wave as also being physically real. So these objects do not propagate, they are instantly extending everywhere. Yes, the waveform does evolve over time as the particle is changing its position and being influenced by other empire waves with quanta of acceleration and, and expression of quanta of work. But there is never a radiative process with these empire waves that moves at a finite speed. It's just there, always there and changing. Like my hands are not, my arms are not radiating out, but they're, but they're changing, right? The wave is changing, it's just not radiating. So that's an idea of the empire wave. So the network of empire waves in my picture is non-local or topological. It's like a topological quantum neural net that, is, that spans both space and time because of the, necess the necessity of integrating it in both directions in the ordered set of your animation. And also because there are other mathematical reasons where you can understand that if you had 10 frames of the QSN to make an animation, in some sense you could find all 10 of them mapped to the four-dimensional object, which is the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal. And Fong and I are very suspicious that to really understand our game of life, we're going to have to understand how particles would propagate relative to the natural pathways in the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal, which is a lot more interesting and curvy than the uh, E8 lattice. It's both, like they're both true. There's, there's a shift vector random walk in E8 and a whole statistical rule there and behavior there, but there's also something that you can approach it from another direction, uh, which is the Elser Sloan quasi crystal. And, and that's where we have not done uh, much exploration, but where Fong and I think that it's very, and Dugan's done some work with us, where we think it's very interesting how the transformation of the root vector polytopes in E8 to the 600 cells in the Elser Sloan quasi crystal intersect or relate to one another in eight ways with seven intersections, one kiss relationship for a total of seven plus one, and where there are very special great circles around the 600 cells that have a volume around these great circles that have um, 30 tetrahedra that close, and where upon that path, that's kind of like a torus, there are these patterns that you can draw which are three periodic and other patterns that you can draw which are five periodic in terms of their rotational symmetry. And where one of these, at least one of these paths of the intersecting 600 cells, where they'll share tetrahedra as they intersect, at least one of them is like found by Dugan and Fong where there's like a freeway on-ramp. So you could be curving on 130 ring like this in Elser Sloan and then you could keep going around in circles if you want, but there's one freeway off-ramp that smoothly transitions you without any glitches in the tetrahedra to another 30 ring in, a, in an adjacent 600 cell. And we don't know yet if there are any other interesting freeway on-ramps between, or connection ramps between the 600 cells. But again, that is an area to study because because of this, if you think about your shift vector code in E8, you have a random walk. There's some code up there, and it may, it may be able to somehow shift in three hyper directions because of this idea of the union of e, the E8 being the union of three copies of A8. And when you shift that and do your random walks up there, it changes the Elser Sloan quasi crystal such that there are quasi-particles in four dimensions in the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal. And I always like to visualize Fong as Maxwell's demon in the Elser Sloan quasi-crystal because she's the one 
who figured out how to create the compound quasicrystal. So if I imagine a miniature Fong at the Planck scale at one tetrahedron, arbitrarily selected in the Elser Sloan quasicrystal, and then I put Ahmed up in eight dimensions, and I call him up and I say, all right, Ahmed, I need you to now move your shift vector one more time, but follow the code. Don't break the rules. So he does that according to some statistical energetic principle like I'm describing. And then what happens is at time two after he does that, Fong observes a change locally such that at time one there was this tetrahedron here. And then at time two there may not be a tetrahedron there because Ahmed has created phason flips or he's created a shift vector in E8 that changes down here. Now if Fong had a rule where every time he did that up in E8, changed the Elser Sloan, Fong, Maxwell's demon, stays at some coordinate in R4, and she just picks the next adjacent tetrahedra in front of her to build her compound quasicrystal. And then she creates this ordered set of those. Then you can generate Fong's animations on the compound quasicrystal animations in R3 by how Ahmed shifts the shift vector in eight dimensions. Or you can have Fong walk around and go to a different coordinate in R4, right, and select a tetrahedron and then do a compounding, right? So it's the idea that, like on the, Penro on the infinite Penrose tiling, any local patch, which could have 100 billion permutations of how you can operate it with phason flips, you could find that exact same local patch by just translating that, that, that size of patch to, to an infinite number of other locations on the Elser Sloan. So either you move around on an infinite quasicrystal to create your animations, or, or you use a shift vector, but they're equivalent. This is like a topological, this is like a quantum field theory, but discretized and using first principles quasicrystal objects, but the objects should be thought of as empire waves, not necessarily empires. Maybe it'll be equivalent, but we need to think in a duality where we think sometimes when helpful the empire waves as being the real actors, and then sometimes we could reduce it down to empire interactions, and we can reduce it all the way down to one-dimensional Fibonacci chains dynamically interacting, and then we can reduce all the way down to zero geometry and recognize that each Fibonacci chain in a dynamic phason animation is really just a string of zeros and ones, which, it, which each string, as it changes dynamically, encodes one and only one unique integer. So I see this each integer and its probabilities as represented on a matrix. And I see the, ne and I see the network of matrices in R4, because the Elser Sloan is made of all Fibonacci chains also and the QSN is made of all Fibonacci chains. So I see each the Elser Sloan quasi-particle dynamics and the QSN quasi-particle dynamics as being represented on a network of matrices, aka a tensor network. And that formalism, because it's dealing with integers and strings of zeros and ones, to me, smells like the most economical way for us to get this physics into a computer. And I, and I couldn't imagine reducing it to any simpler formalism than just zeros and ones on a tensor network of matrices. So I've done my best here to reinforce and update you guys with my best attempt at explaining our, our game of life um, or my version of our game of life's explanation from concepts that mix explanations uh, or, you know, just kind of conjectures about how it could relate to thermodynamics in terms of the W value of parallel vector classes and Boltzmann entropy, um, hidden variables-based quantum statistics that do not violate Bell's theorem, the idea of information and noise, right, and uh, computation theory and the principle of least computational action. And also a little bit of uh, aspect of gravitational theory uh, in, in my suggestion of a first principles idea of a quantum of, uh, of work and, and what mass does. And uh, an aspect of special relativity in an explanation for the speed limit of particles in this game of life, as well as an explanation for the relationship between propagation through internal clock time versus 
propagation forward uh, through space.